The War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells, Part 3, Chapter 15. What had happened in Surrey? It was while the curate had sat and talked so wildly to me under the hedge in the flat meadows near Halliford, and while my brother was watching the fugitives stream over Westminster Bridge, that the Martians had resumed the offensive. So far as one could ascertain from the conflicting accounts that have been put forth, the majority of them remained busied with preparations in the horse-cell pit until nine that night, hurrying on some operation that disengaged huge volumes of green smoke. But three certainly came out about eight o'clock, and advancing slowly and cautiously, made their way through Blyfleet and Pierford towards Ripley and Weybridge, and so came in sight of the expectant batteries against the setting sun. These Martians did not advance in a body, but in a line, each perhaps a mile and a half from his nearest fellow. They communicated with one another by means of siren-like howls, running up and down the scale from one note to another. It was this howling and firing of the guns at Ripley and at St. George's Hill that we have heard at Upper Halliford. The Ripley gunners, unseasoned artillery volunteers who ought never to have been placed in such a position, fired one wild, premature, ineffectual volley and bolted on horse and foot through the deserted village, while the Martian, without using his heat ray, walked serenely over their guns, stepped gingerly among them, passed in front of them, and so came unexpectedly upon the guns in Payne Shill Park, which he destroyed. The St. George's Hill men, however, were better led, or of a better metal. Hidden by a pine wood, as they were, they seemed to have been quite unsuccessful expected by the Martian nearest to them. They laid their guns as deliberately as if they had been on parade and fired at about a thousand yards range. The shells flashed all round him and he was seen to advance a few paces, stagger and go down. Everybody yelled together and the guns were reloaded in frantic haste. The overthrown Martian set up a prolonged ululation, and immediately a second glittering giant answered him, appeared over the trees to the south. It would seem that a leg of the tripod had been smashed by one of the shells. The whole of the second volley flew wide of the Martian on the ground, and simultaneously both his companions brought their heat rays to bear on the battery. The ammunition blew up. The pine trees all about the guns flashed into fire, and one, only one or two of the men who were already running over the crest of the hill escaped. After this, it would seem that the three took counsel together and halted, and the scouts who were watching them report that they remained absolutely stationary for the next half hour. The Martian, who had been overthrown, crawled tediously out of his hood, a small brown figure oddly suggestive from the distance of a speck of blight and apparently engaged in the repair of his support. 
About nine he had finished, for his cow was then seen above the trees again. It was a few minutes past nine that night when these three sentinels were joined by four other Martians, each carrying a thick black tube. A similar tube was handed to each of the three, and the seven proceeded to distribute themselves at equal distances along a curved line between St. George's Hill, Weybridge, and the village of Send, southwest of Ripley. A dozen rockets sprang out of the hills before them so soon as they began to move and warned the waiting batteries about Ditton and Escher. At the same time, four of their fighting machines, similarly armed with tubes, crossed the river, and two of them, black against the western sky, came into sight of myself and the curate as we hurried warily and painfully along the road that runs northward out of Halliford. They moved, as it seemed to us, upon a cloud, for a milky mist covered the fields and rose to a third of their height. At this sight, the curate cried faintly in his throat and began running. But I knew it was no good running from a Martian, then I turned aside and called through dewy nettles and brambles into the broad ditch by the side of the road. He looked back, saw what I was doing, and turned to join me. The two halted, the nearer to us standing and facing Sunbury, the remoter being a gray indistinctness towards the evening star, away towards Staines. The occasional howling of the Martians had ceased. They took up their positions in the huge crescent about their cylinders in absolute silence. It was a crescent with twelve miles between its horns. Never since the devising of gunpowder was the beginning of the battle so still. To us, and to an observer about Ripley, it would have had precisely the same effect. The Martians seemed in solitary possession of the darkly night, lit only as it was by the slender moon, the stars, the afterglow of the daylight, and the ruddy glare from St. George's Hill and the woods of Painshill. But facing the crescent everywhere at Staines, Hounslow, Ditton, Escher, Ockham, behind hills and woods south of the river, and across the flat grass meadows to the north of it, wherever a cluster of trees or village houses gave sufficient cover, the guns were waiting. The signal rockets burst and rained their sparks through the night and vanished. And the spirit of all those watching batteries rose to a tense expectation. The Martians had but to advance into the line of fire and instantly those motionless black forms of men, those guns glittering so darkly in the early night would explode into a thunderous fury of battle. No doubt the thought that was uppermost in a thousand of those vigilant minds, even as it was uppermost in mine, was the riddle. How much they understood of us. Did they grasp that why we in our millions were organized discipline working together? Or did they interpret our spurts of fire, the sudden stinging of our shells, our steady investment of their encampment, as we should the furious unanimity of onslaught in a disturbed hive of bees? 
Did they dream they might exterminate us? At that time, no one knew what food they needed. A hundred such questions struggled together in my mind as I watched that vast sentinel shape. And in the back of my mind was the sense of all the huge, unknown, and hidden forces Londonward. Had they prepared fit pitfalls? Were the powder mills at Hunslow ready as a snare? Would the Londoners have the heart and courage to make a greater Moscow of their mighty province of houses? Then after an interminable time, as it seemed to us, crouching and peering through the hedge, came a sound like the distant concussion of gun. Another nearer, and then another, and then the Martian beside us raised his tube on high and discharged it gunwise, with a heavy report that made the ground heave. The one towards Staines answered him. There was no flash, no smoke, simply that loaded detonation. I was so excited by these heavy minute guns following one another that I so far forgot my personal safety and my scalded hands as to clamber up into the hedge and stare towards Sunbury. As I did, so a second report followed, and a big projectile hurtled overhead towards Hounslow. I expected at least to see smoke or fire or some such evidence of its work, but all I saw was the deep blue sky above with one solitary star and the white mist spreading wide and low beneath. And there had been no crash, no answering explosion. The silence was restored the minute lengthened to three. What has happened, said the curate, standing up beside me. Heaven knows, I said I. A bat flickered by and vanished. A distant tumult of shouting began and ceased. I looked again at the Martian and saw he was now moving eastward along the river bank with a swift, rolling motion. Every moment I expect the fire of some hidden battery to spring upon me, him, but the evening calm was unbroken. The figure of the Martian grew smaller as he receded, and presently the mist and the gathering night had swallowed him up. A common impulse we clambered higher towards Sunbury was a dark appearance, as though a conical hill had suddenly come into being there, hiding our view of the farther country, and then remoter across the river over Walton we saw another such summit. These hill-like forms grew lower and broader even as we stared. Moved by a sudden thought, I looked northward, and there I perceived a third of these cloudy black corpses had risen. Everything had suddenly become very still, far away to the southeast, marking the quiet. We heard the Martians hooting to one another, and then the air quivered again with the distant thud of their guns. But the earthly Artillery made no reply. Now, at the time, we could not understand these things, but later I was to learn the meaning of these ominous coaches that gathered in the twilight. Each of the Martians, standing in the great crescent I have described, had discharged, by means of the gun-like tube he carried, a huge canister over whatever hill, cops, cluster of houses or other possible cover for guns chanced to be in front of him. Some fired only one of these, some two, as in the case of the one we had seen, the one at Ripley, is said to have discharged no fewer than five at that time. 
These canisters smashed on striking the ground. They did not explode. And inconvenient, incontentedly disengaged an enormous volume of heavy, inky vapor coiling and pouring upward in a huge and ebony cumulus cloud, a gaseous hill that sank and spread itself slowly over the surrounding country. In the touch of the vapor, the inhaling of its pungent wisps was death to all that breathes. It was heavy, this vapor, heavier than the densest smoke, so that after the first tumultuous uprush and outflow of its impact, it sank down through the air and poured over the ground in a matter rather liquid than gaseous, abandoning the hills and streaming into the valleys and ditches and watercourses, even as I have heard the carbonic acid gas that pours from volcanic clefts is won't do, won't to do. And where it came upon water, so chemical action occurred. And the surface would be instantly covered with a powdery scum that sank slowly and made way for more. The scum was absolutely insoluble, and it is a strange thing, seeing the instant effect of the gas that one could drink without hurt the water from which it had been strained. The vapor did not diffuse as a true gas would do. It hung together in banks flowing sluggishly down the slope of the land and driving reluctantly before the wind, and very slowly it combined with the mist and moisture of the air and sank to the earth in the form of dust. Save that an unknown element giving a group of four lines in the blue of the spectrum is concerned, we are still entirely ignorant of the nature of this substance. Once the tumultuous upheaval of its dispersion was over, the black smoke hung so closely to the ground, even before its precipitation, that fifty feet up in the air, on the roofs and upper stories of high houses and on great trees, there was a chance of escaping its poison altogether. As was proved, even that night, its street Cobham and Ditton. The man who escaped at the former place tells a wonderful story of the strangeness of its coiling flow and how he looked down from the church spire and saw the houses of the village rising like ghosts out of its inky nothingness. For a day and a half he remained there, weary starving and sun-scorched, the earth under the blue sky and against the prospect of the distant hills at velvet black expanse with red roofs, green trees, and later black veiled shrub shrubs and gates, barns, outhouses, and walls rising here and there into the sunlight. But that was at Street Cobham, where the black vapor was allowed to remain until it sank of its own accord into the ground. As a rule, the Martians, when it had served its purpose, cleared the air of it again by wading into it and directing a jet of stream upon it. This they did with the vapor banks near us, as we saw in the starlight from the window of a deserted house at Upper Halliford, whither we had returned. From there we could see the searchlights on Richmond Hill and Kingston Hill going to and fro, and about eleven the windows rattled and we heard the sound of a huge siege guns that had been put in position there. 
These continued intermittently for the space of a quarter of an hour, sending chance shots at the visible, invisible Martians at Hampton and Ditton, and then the pale beams of the electric light vanished and were replaced by a bright red glow. Then the fourth cylinder fell, a brilliant green meteor. As I leaned afterwards in Bushy Park, before the guns on the Richmond and Kingston line of hills began, there was a fitful cannonade far away in the northwest, due, I believe, to guns being fired haphazardly before the black vapor could overwhelm the gunners. So setting about it as metho methodically as men might smoke out a wasp nest, the Martians spread this strange stifling vapor over the Londonward country. The horns of the crescent slowly moved apart until at last they formed a line from Hanwell to Cumbe to Malden. All night through their destruction tubes advanced. Never once after the Martian at St. George's Hill was brought down did they give the artillery the ghost of a chance against them. Whenever there was a possibility of guns being laid for them unseen, a fresh canister of the black vapor was discharged. And where the guns were openly displayed, the heat ray was brought to bear. By midnight, the blazing trees along the slopes of Richmond Park and the glare of Kingston Hill threw their light upon a network of black smoke, blotting out the whole valley of the Thames, extending as far as the eye could reach. And through this, two Martians slowly waited and turned their hissing steam jets this way and that. They were sparing of the heat ray that night, either because they had but a limited supply of material for its production, or because they did not wish to destroy the country, but only to crush and overawe the opposition they had aroused. In the latter aim, they certainly succeeded. Sunday night was the end of the organized opposition to their movements. After that, nobody of man would stand against them. So hopeless was the enterprise. Even the crew of the torpedo boats and destroyers that had brought their quick Firers up the Thames refused to stop, mutinied, and went down again. The only offensive operation men ventured upon after that night was the preparation of mines and pitfalls. And even in that, their energies were frantic and spasmodic. One has to imagine, as well as one may, the fate of those batteries towards Escher, waiting so tensely in the twilight. Survivors there were none. One may picture the orderly expectation, the officers alert and watchful, the gunners ready, the ammunition piled to hand the limber gunners with their horses and wagons, the groups of civilian spectators standing as near as they were permitted, the evening stillness, the ambulances and hospital tents, with the burned and wounded from Weybridge, then the dull resonance of the shots the Martians fired and the clumsy projectile whirling over the trees and houses and smashing amid the neighboring fields. One may picture, too, the sudden shifting of the attention, the swiftly spreading coils 
and bellyings of the blackness advancing headlong, towering, headward, turning the twilight to a palpable darkness. A strange and horrible antagonist of vapor striding upon its victims. Men and horses, near as it seemed dimly, running, shrieking, falling headlong, shouts of dismay. The guns suddenly abandoned, men choking and writhing on the ground, and the swift broadening out of the opaque cone of smoke. In the night, an extinction, nothing but a silent mass of impenetrable vapor hiding its dead. Before dawn, the black vapor was pouring through the streets of Richmond, and the disintegrating organism of government was, with a last expiring effort, rousing the population of London to its necessity of flight. Chapter 16 The Exodus from London So you understand the roaring wave of fear that swept through the greatest city in the world just as Monday was dawning. The stream of flight rising swiftly to a torrent, lashing in a foaming tumult round the railway stations, banked up into a horrible struggle about the shipping and themes, and hurrying by every available channel northward and eastward. By ten o'clock, the police organization and by midday, even the railway organization were losing coherency, losing shape and efficiency, guttering, softening, running, at last in that swift liquefaction of the social body. All the railway lines, north of the Thames and the southeastern people at Cannon Street had been warned by midnight, on Sunday, and trains were being filled. People were fighting savagely for standing room in the carriages, even at two o'clock. By three, people were being trampled and crushed, even in Bishopsgate Street, a couple of hundred yards or more from Liverpool Street Station. Revolvers were fired, people stabbed and the policemen, who had been sent to direct the traffic, exhausted and infuriated, were breaking the heads of the people they were called out to protect. And as the day advanced and the engine drivers and stokers refused to return to London, the pressure of the flight drove the people in an ever-thickening multitude away from the stations and along the northward running roads. By midday, a Martian had been seen at Barnes, and a cloud of slowly sinking black vapor drove along the Thames and across the flats of Lambeth, cutting off all escape over the bridges in its sluggish advance. Another bank drove over Ealing and surrounded a little island of survivors on Castle Hill alive but unable to escape. After a fruitless struggle to get aboard a northwestern train at Chalk Farm, the engines of the trains that had loaded in the goods yard were plowed through shrieking people, and a dozen stalwart men fought to keep the crowd from crushing the driver against his furnace. My brother emerged upon the chalk farm road, dodged across through a hurrying swarm of vehicles, and had the luck to be the foremost in the sack of a cycle shop. The front tire of the machine he got was punctured and dragging it through the window, but he got up and off, notwithstanding, with no further injury than a cut wrist. 
The steep foot of Haverstock Hill was impassable owing to several overturned horses, and my brother struck into Belsize Road. So we got out of the fury of the panic and skirting the Edgeware Road, reached Edgeware about seven, fasting and wearied, but well ahead of the crowd. Along the road, people were standing in the roadway, curious, wondering. He was passed by a number of cyclists, some horsemen, and two motor cars. A mile from Edgeware, the rim of the wheel broke, and the machine became unrideable. He left it by the roadside and trudged through the village. There were shops half open in the main street of the place, and people crowded on the pavement and in the doorways and windows, staring astonished at the extraordinary procession of fugitives that was beginning. He succeeded in getting some food at an inn. For a time, he remained in Edgeware, not knowing what next to do. The flying people increased in number. Many of them, like my brother, seemed inclined to loiter in the place. There was no fresh news of the invaders from Mars. At that time, the road was crowded, but as yet far from congested. Many of the fugitives at the hour were mounted on cycles, but there were soon motor cars, handsome cabs, and carriages hurrying along, and the dust hung in the heavy air clouds along the road to St. Albans. It was perhaps a vague idea of making his way to Chelmsford, where some friends of his lived that at last induced my brother to strike into a quiet lane running eastward. Presently, he came upon a stile and crossed it, followed a footpath northeastward. He passed near several farmhouses and some little places whose names he did not learn. He saw few fugitives until... In a glass lane towards High Barnet, he happened upon two ladies who became his fellow travelers. He came upon them and just in time to save them. He heard their screams and hurried round the corner, saw a couple of men struggling to drag them out of their little pony chase in which they had been driving while a third with difficulty held the frightened pony's head. One of the ladies, a short woman, dressed in white, was simply screaming. The other, a dark, slender figure, slashed at the man who gripped her arm with a whip she held in her disengaged hand. My brother immediately grasped the situation, shouted, and hurried towards the struggle one of the men desisted and turned towards him, and my brother, realizing from his antagonist's face that a fight was unavoidable, and being an expert barkser, went into him forthwith and sent him down against the wheel of the chase. It was no time for pugilistic chivalry, and my brother laid him quiet with a kick and gripped the collar of the man who pulled at the slender lady's arm. He heard the clatter of hoofs, and the whip stung across his face. A third antagonist struck him between the eyes, and the man he held wrenched himself free and made off down the lane in the direction from which he had come. Partly stunned, he found himself facing the man who had held the horse's head, and became aware of the chase receding from him down the lane, swaying from side to side, and with the women in it looking back. The man before him, a burly rough, tried to close, and he stopped him with a blow in the face. Then realizing that he was deserted, he dodged round and made off down the lane after the chase. 
with the sturdy man close behind and the fugitive, who had turned now following remotely. Suddenly, he stumbled and fell. His immediate pursuer went headlong, and he rose to his feet to find himself with a couple of antagonists again. He would have had little chance against them had not the slender lady very pluckily pulled up and returned to his help. It seems she had had a revolver all this time, but it had been under the seat when she and her companion were attacked. <clears throat> he would... She fired at six yards distance, narrowly missing my brother. She less courageous of the robbers made off, and his companion followed him, cursing his cowardice. They both stopped in sight down the lane, when the third man lay insensible. Take this, said the slender lady, and she gave my brother her revolver. Go back to the chase, said my brother, wiping the blood from his split lip. She turned without a word. They were both panting, and they went back to where the lady in the white struggled to hold back the frightened pony. The robbers had evidently had enough of it. When my brother looked again, they were retreating. I'll sit here, said my brother, if I may. And he got upon the empty front seat. The lady looked over and her shoulder... Give me the rein, she said, and laid the whip along the pony's side. In another moment, a bend of the road hid the three men from my brother's sight. So quite unexpectedly, my brother found himself panting, with a cut mouth, a bruised jaw, and blood-stained knuckles. Driving along an unlaned lane, lane with these two women, he learned they were the wife and the younger sister of a surgeon living at Stanmore, who had come in the small hours from a dangerous case at Pinner, and heard at some railway station on his way of the Martians' advance. He had hurried home, roused the women, her servant, had left them two days before, packed some provisions, put his revolver under the seat, luckily for my brother, and told them to drive on to Edgeware, with the idea of getting a train there. He stopped behind to tell the neighbors. He would overtake them, he said. At about half past four in the morning, and now it was nearly nine, and they had seen nothing of him. They could not stop in Edgware because of the growing traffic through the place, and so they had come into this side lane. That was the story they told my brother in fragments, when presently they stopped again, nearer to New Barnet. He promised to stay with them, at least until they could determine what to do, or until the missing man arrived, and professed to be an expert shot with the revolver, a weapon strange to him, in order to give them confidence. They made a sort of encampment by the wayside, and the pony became happy in the hedge. He told them of his own escape out of London, and all that he knew of these Martians and their ways. The sun crept higher in the sky, and after a time, their talk died out and gave place to an uneasy state of anticipation. Several wayfarers came along the lane, and of these, my brother gathered such news as he could. Every broken answer, he had deepened his impression of the great disaster that had come on humanity, deepened his persuasion of the immediate necessity for prosecuting this flight. He urged the matter upon them. We have money, said the slender woman, and hesitated. Her eyes met my brother's, and her hesitation ended 
So have I, said my brother. She explained that they had as much as 30 pounds in gold besides a five pound note and suggested that with that they might get upon a train at South Albans or New Barnett. My brother thought that was hopeless, seeing the fury of the Londoners to crowd upon the trains, and broached his own idea of striking across Essex towards Harwich, and then escaping from the country altogether. Mrs. Elphinstone, which was the name of the woman in white, would listen to no reasoning, and kept calling upon George. But her sister-in-law was astonishingly quiet and deliberate, and at last agreed to my brother's suggestion. So designing to cross the great north road, they went on towards Barnett, my brother leading the pony to save it as much as possible as the sun crept up the sky. The day became excessively hot, and underfoot a thick, whitish sand grew burning and blinding, so that they traveled only very slowly. The hedges were gray with dust, and as they advanced towards Barnett, a tumultuous murmuring grew stronger. They began to meet more people. For the most part, they were staring before them, murmuring indistinct questions, jaded, haggard, unclean. One man in evening dress passed them on foot, his eyes on the ground. They heard his voice, and looking back at him, saw one hand clutched in his hair and the other beating invisible things. His paroxysm of rage over, he went on his way without once looking back. And my brother's party went on towards the crossroads to the south of Barnett. They saw a woman approaching the road across some fields on their left, carrying a child and two other children. And then passed a man in dirty black with a thick stick in one hand and a small portmanteau in the other. Then round the corner of the lane, from between the villas that guarded it at its confluence with the high road came a little cart, down by a sweating black pony and driven by a sallow youth in a bowler hat gray with dust. There were three girls, East End factory girls, and a couple of little children crowded in the cart. This'll take us round Edgware, asked the driver, wild-eyed, white-faced. And when my brother told him it would, if he turned to the left, he whipped up at once, without the formality of thanks. My brother noticed a pale gray smoke, or haze, rising among the houses in front of them, veiling the white facade of a terrace beyond the road, that appeared between the backs of the villas. Miss Ethel Stone suddenly cried out at a number of tongues of smoky red flames leaping up above the houses in front of them against the hot blue sky. The tumultuous noise resolved itself now into the disorderly mingling of many voices, the gride of many wheels, the creaking of wagons and the staccato of hooves. The lane came round sharply not fifty yards from the crossroads. Good heavens, cried Miss Elphilstone. What is this you are driving us into? My brother stopped. For the main road was a boiling stream of people, a torrent of human beings rushing northward, one pressing on another. A great bank of dust, white and luminous in the blaze of the sun, made everything within twenty feet of the ground gray and indistinct, and was perpetually renewed by the hurrying feet of a dense crowd of horses and on of men and women on foot, and by the wheels of the vehicles of every description. 
Way! My brother heard voices crying, Make way! It was like riding into the smoke of a fire to approach the meeting point of the lane and road. The crowd roared like a fire, and the dust was hot and pungent. And indeed, a little way up the road, a villa was burning and sending rolling masses of black smoke across the road to add to the confusion. Two men came past them, and a dirty woman carrying a heavy bundle and weeping. A lost retriever dog with hanging tongue circled dubiously around them, scared and wretched, and fled at my brother's threat. So much as they could see of the road Londonward between the houses to the right was a tumultuous stream of dirty hurrying people pent in between the villas on either side. The black heads, the crowded forms, growing into distinctness as they rushed towards the corner, hurried past and merged their individuality again in a receding multitude that was swallowed up at last in a cloud of dust. Go on, go on, cried the voices. Way, way. Brother stood at the pony's head, irresistibly attracted. He advanced slowly, pace by pace, down the lane. Edgeware had been a scene of confusion, chalk farm, a riotous tumult, but this was a whole population in movement. It is hard to imagine the host. It had no character of its own. The figures poured out past the corner and receded with their backs to the group in the lane. Along the margin came those who were on foot threatened by the wheels, stumbling in the ditches, blundering into one another. The carts and carriages crowded close upon one another, making little way for the swifter and more impatient vehicles that darted forward every now and then, when an opportunity showed itself of doing so. Sending the people scattering against the fences and gates of the villas. Push on, was the cry. Push on, they are coming. In one cart stood a blind man in the uniform of the Salvation Army, gesticulating with his crooked fingers and bawling. Eternity, eternity, his voice was hoarse and very loud so that my brother could hear him long after he was lost to sight in the dust. Some of the people who crowded in the carts whipped stupidly at their horses and coiled with other drivers. Some sat motionless, staring at nothing with miserable eyes. Some nod their hands with thirst or lay prostate in the bottoms of their conveyances. The horses' bits were covered with foam, their eyes bloodshot. There were cabs, carriages, shop cars, wagons, beyond counting. A mail cart, a road cleaner's cart marked Vestry of St. Pancras, a huge timber wagon crowded with roofs. A brewer's dray rumbled by with its two near wheels splashed with fresh blood. Clear the way, cried the voices, clear the way. Eternity, eternity came echoing down the road. There were sad, 
haggard woman tramping by, well dressed, with children that cried and stumbled, their dainty clothes smothered in dust, their weary faces smeared with tears. With many of these came men, sometimes helpful, sometimes lowering and savage, fighting side by side with them pushed some weary street outcast in faded black rags wide-eyed loud-voiced and foul-mouthed there were study workmen thrusting their way along wretched unkept men clothed like clerks or shopmen struggling spasmodically a wounded soldier my brother noticed men dressed in the clothes of railway porters one ratchet creature in a nightshirt with a coat thrown over it but varied as its composition was certain things all that host had in common there were fear and pain on their faces and fear behind them a tumult up the road a quarrel for a place in a wagon sent the whole host of them quickening their pace even a man so scared and broken with his knees bent under him was galvanized for a moment into renewed activity his heat and dust had already been at work upon his multitude their skins were dry their lips black and cracked they were all thirsty weary and footsore and amid the various cries one heard disputes reproaches groans of weariness and fatigue the voices of most of them were hoarse and weak through it all ran a refrain way way the martians are coming few stopped and came aside from that flood the lane opened slantingly into the main road with a narrow opening and had a delusive appearance of coming from the direction of London. Yet a kind of eddy of people drove into its mouth. Weaklings elbowed out of the stream, who for the most part rested but a moment before plunging into it again. A little way down the lane, with two friends bending over him, lay a man with a bare leg, wrapped about with bloody rags. He was a lucky man to have friends. A little old man, with a gray military mustache and a filthy black frock coat, limped out and sat down beside the trap, removed his boot. His sock was blood-stained, shook out a petal pebble, and hobbled on again. And then a little girl of eight or nine, all alone, threw herself under the hedge close by my brother, weeping. I can't go on, I can't go on. My brother woke from his stupor, of astonishment and lifted her up gently speaking to her and carried her to miss elfinstone so soon as my brother churched her she became quite still as if frightened ellen shrieked the woman in the crowd with tears in her voice ellen and the child suddenly darted away from my brother crying mother they are coming said a man on horseback riding past along the lane out of the way there bawled a coachman towering high and my brother saw 
a closed carriage turning into the lane. The people crushed back on one another to avoid the horse. My brother pushed the pony and chased back into the hedge, and the man drove by and stopped at the turn of the way. It was a carriage with a pole for a pair of horses, but only one was in the traces. For brother saw dimly through the dust that two men lifted out something on a white stretcher and put it gently on the grass beneath the pivot hedge. One of the men came running to my brother. Where is there any water? He is dying fast, he said, and very thirsty. It is Lord Garrick. Lord Garrick, said my brother, the chief justice. The water, he said. There may be a tap, said my brother, and some of the houses we have no water. I dare not leave my people. The man pushed against the crowd towards the gate of the corner house. Go on, said the people, thrusting at him. They are coming. Go on. Then my brother's attention was distracted by a bearded eagle-faced man lugging a small handbag, which split even as my brother's eyes rested on it and disgorged a mass of sovereigns that seemed to break up into separate coins as it struck the ground. They rolled hither and thither among the struggling feet of men and horses. The man stopped and looked stupidly at the heap, and the shaft of a cab struck his shoulder and sent him reeling. He gave a shriek, dodged in back, and a cartwheel shaved him narrowly. Way! cried the man all about him. Make way! So soon as the cab had passed, he flung himself with both hands open upon the heap of coins and began thrusting handfuls in his pockets. A horse rose close upon him, and in another moment, half rising, he had been borne down under the horse's hooves. Stop! screamed my brother, and pushing a woman out of his way, tried to clutch the bit of the horse. Before he could get it, he heard a scream under the wheel and saw the dust, the rim passing over the poor wretch's back. The driver of the cart slashed his whip at my brother, who ran round behind the cart, the multitudinous shouting confused his ears. The man was writhing in the dust among his scattered money. Unable to rise, for the wheel had broken his back, and his lower limbs lay limp and dead. My brother stood up and yelled at the next driver, and a man on a black horse came to his assistance. Get him out of the road, said he, and clutching the man's collar with his free hand, my brother lugged him sideways. But he still clutched after his money and regarded my brother fiercely, hammering at his arm with a handful of gold. Go on, go on, shit in angry voices behind him. Way, way, there was a smash as the pole of a carriage crashed into the cart that the man on horseback stopped. My brother looked up, and the man with the gold twisted his head round and bit the wrist that held his collar. There was a concussion, and the black horse came staggering sideways, and the court horse pushed beside it. A hoof missed my brother's foot by a hair's breadth. He released his grip on the fallen man and jumped back. He saw anger change to terror on the face of the poor wretch on the ground, and in a moment he was hidden, and my brother was borne backwards and carried past the entrance of the lane and had to fight hard in the torrent to recover it. He saw Miss Elphinstone covering her eyes, and a little child, with all the child's want of sympathetic imagination, staring with dilated eyes at a dusty something that lay black and still, ground and crushed under the rolling wheels. Let us go back, he shouted, and began turning the pony round. He cannot cross this hell he said, and they went back at a hundred yards the way they had come until the fighting crowd was hidden. As they passed the bend in the lane, my brother saw the face of the dying man in the ditch under the privet, deadly white and drawn, 
and shining with perspiration. The two women sat silent, crouching in their seats and shivering. And beyond the bend, my brother stopped again. Miss Ethelstone was white and pale. Her sister-in-law sat weeping, too wretched even to call upon George. My brother was horrified and perplexed. So soon as they had retreated, he realized how urgent and unavoidable it was to attempt this crossing. He turned to Miss Ethelstone, suddenly resolute. We must go that way, he said, and led the pony round again. For the second time that day, this girl proved her quality. To force their way into the torrent of people, my brother plunged into the traffic and held back a cab horse while she drove the pony across its head. A wagon lock wheels for a moment and ripped a long splinter from the chase. In a moment, they were caught and swept forward by the stream. My brother, with the cabman's whip marks, Red across his face and hands, scrambled into the chase and took the reins from her. Point the revolver at the man behind, he said, giving it to her. If he presses us too hard, no. Point it at his horse. And then he began to look out for a chance of edging to the right across the road. But once in the stream, he seemed to lose volition to become a part of the dusty route. They swept through Chipping Barnett with the torrent. They were nearly a mile wide beyond the center of the town before they had fought across to the opposite side of the way. It was din and confusion indescribable. But in and beyond the town, the road forks repeatedly. And this, to some extent, relieved the stress. They struck eastward through Hadley, and there, on either side of the road, and at another place farther on, they came upon a great multitude of people drinking at the stream, some fighting to come at the water. And further on, from a low east barnet, they saw two trains running slowly, one after the other, without signal or order. Trains swarming with people, with men, even among the coals behind the engines, going northward along the great northern railway. My brother supposes they must have filled outside London, for at the time the furious terror of the people had rendered the central termini impossible. Near this place they halted for the rest of the afternoon for the violence of the day had already utterly exhausted all three of them. They began to suffer the beginnings of hunger. The night was cold, and none of them dared to sleep, and in the evening many people came hurrying along the road near, by their stopping place, fleeing from unknown dangers before them and going in the direction from which my brother had come. Chapter 17 The Thunder Child Had the Martians aimed only at destruction, they might on Monday have annihilated the entire population of London. As it spread before itself, slowly through the homes, home countries, not only along the road through Barnet, but also through Edgware and Waltham Abbey, and along the roads eastward to South End and Shoeburyness, and south of the Thames to Deal and Broadstairs poured the same frantic rout. If one could have hung that June morning in a balloon, in the blazing blue above London, every northward and eastward road running out of the tangled maze of streets would have seemed stippled black with the streaming fugitives, each dot a human agony of terror and physical distress. I have set forth at length in this chapter with my brother's account of the road through Chipping Barnett 
in order that my readers may realize how that swarming of black dots appeared to one of those concerned. Never before in the history of the world had such a mass of human beings moved and suffered together. Legendary hosts of Goths and Huns, the hugest armies Asia has ever seen, would have been but a drop in that current. And this was no discipline march, it was a stampede. A stampede gigantic and terrible. Without order and without a goal, six million people unarmed, unprovisioned, driving headlong. It was the beginning of the rout of civilization, of the massacre of mankind. Directly below him, the balloonist would have seen the network of streets Far and wide, houses, churches, squares, crescents, gardens, already derelict, spread out like a huge map, and in the southward blotted, over Ealing, Richmond, Wimbledon, it would have seemed as if some monstrous pen had flung ink upon the chart. Steadily, insistently, each black splash grew and spread, shooting out ramifications this way, and that, now banking itself against rising ground, now pouring swiftly over a crest into a new found valley, exactly as a gout of ink would spread itself upon blotting paper. And beyond, over the blue hills that rise southward of the river, the glittering Martians went to and fro. Calmly, methodically, spreading their poison cloud over this patch of country and then over that. Laying it again with their stream, jets, when it had served its purpose and taking possession of the conquered country. They do not seem to have aimed at extermination so much as a complete demoralization and the destruction of any opposition. They exploded. Any stores of power they came upon cut every telegraph and wretched wrecked the railways here and there. They were hamstringing mankind. They seemed in no hurry to extend the field of their operations and did not come beyond the central part of London all that day. It is possible that a very considerable number of people in London stuck to their houses through Monday morning. Certain it is that many died at home suffocated by the black smoke. Until about midday, the pool of London was an astonishing scene. Steamboats and shipping of all sorts lay there, tempted by the enormous sums of money offered by fugitives. And it is said that many who swam out to the vessels were thrust off with boat hooks and drowned. About one o'clock in the afternoon, the thinning remnant of a cloud of black stupor vapor appeared between the arches of Blackfriar Bridge. At that, the pool became a scene of mad confusion, fighting, and collisions, and for some time a multitude of boats and barges jammed in the northern arch of the tower bridge, and the sailor and the lighter man had to fight savagely against the people who swarmed upon them from the riverboat front. People were actually clambering down the piers of the bridge from above. When an hour later a Martian appeared beyond the clock tower and waded down the river, nothing but wreckage floated above the limehouse of the falling of the fifth cylinder I have presently to tell. The sixth star fell at Wimbledon, my brother keeping watch beside the woman in the chase and in the meadow, 
saw the green flash of it far beyond the hills. On Tuesday, the little party still set upon getting across the sea made its way through the swarming country towards Colchester. The news had the Martians were now in possession of the whole of London was confirmed. They had been seen at Highgate and even it was said at Neat's Nestin. They did not come into my brother's view until the morrow. The day that scattered multitudes began to realize the urgent need of provisions. As they grew hungry, the rights of property ceased to be regarded. Farmers were out to defend their cattle sheds, granaries, and ripening root crops with arms in their hands. A number of people now, like my brother, had their faces eastward, and there were some desperate souls even going back towards London to get food. They were chiefly people from the northern suburbs whose knowledge of the black smoke came by hearsay. He heard that about half the member of the government had gathered at Birmingham and that enormous quantities of high explosives were being prepared to be used in automatic mines across the Midland country. Counties. He was also told that the Midland Railway Company had replaced the desertions of the first day's panic, had resumed traffic, and was running northward trains from St. Albans to relieve the congestion of the home counties. There was also a placard in shipping Onger announcing the large stores of flour were available in the northern towns and that within 24 hours bread would be distributed among the starving people in the neighborhood. But this intelligence did not deter him from the plan of escape he had formed, and the three pressed eastward all day, and heard no more of the bread distribution than this promise. Nor, as a matter of fact, did anyone else hear more of it. That night fell the seventh star falling upon Upon Primrose Hill. It fell while Miss Elphinstone was watching, for she took that duty alternately with my brother. She saw it. On Wednesday, the three fugitives, they had passed the night in a field of unripe wheat, reached Chelmsford. And there, a body of the inhabitants calling itself the Committee of the Public Supply, seize the pony as provisions and would give nothing in exchange for it but the promise of a share in it the next day. Here there were rumors of the Martians at Epping and news of the destruction of Waltham Abbey powder mills in a vain attempt to blow up one of the invaders. People were watching for Martians here, from the church towers. My brother, very luckily for him, as it chanced, preferred to push on at once to the coast rather than wait for food, although all three of them were very hungry. By midday they passed through Tillingham, which, strangely enough, seemed to be quite still and deserted, save for a few fugitives plundering, hunting, Food for food. Near Tillingham, they suddenly came into sight of the sea, and the most amazing crowd of shipping of all sorts that is, is possible to imagine. For after the sailors could no longer come up the Thames, they came up on to the Essex coast, to Harwich and Walton and Clacton, and afterwards to Foulness and Shoebury to bring off the people. They lay in a huge sickle-shaped curve that vanished into the mist at last towards the naze. Close inshore was a multitude of fishing smacks, 
English, Scotch, French, Dutch, and Swedish. Steam launches from the Thames, yachts, electric boats, and beyond there were ships of a large burden, a multitude of filthy colliers, trim merchantmen, cattle ships, passenger boats, petroleum tanks, ocean tramps, an old white transport even, neat white and gray liners from the Southampton and Hamburg. And along the blue coast, across the black water, my brother could make out dimly a dense swarm of boats chaffering with the people on the beach. A swarm which also extended up the black water almost to Malden. About a couple of miles out lay an ironclad very low in the water, almost to my brother's perception, like a waterlogged ship. This was the ram, Thunderchild, who was the only warship in sight, but far away to the right over the smooth surface of the sea. For that day there was a dead calm, lay a serpent of black smoke to mark the next ironclads of the channel fleet, which hovered in an extended line, steam up and ready for action across the Thames estuary, during the course of the Martians' conquest, vigilant and yet powerless to prevent it. At the side of the sea, Miss Elphinstone, in spite of the assurances of her sister-in-law, gave way to panic. She had never been out of England before. She would rather die than trust herself friendless in a foreign country and so forth. She seemed, poor woman, to imagine that the French and the Martians might prove very similar. She had been growing increasingly hysterical, fearful, and depressed during the two days' journeys. Her great idea was to return to Stanmar. Things that had been always well and safe at Stanmar they would find George at Stanmore. It was with the greatest difficulty they could get her down to the beach, where presently my brother succeeded in attracting the attention of some men on a paddle steamer from the Thames. They sent a boat and drove a bargain for thirty-six pounds for the three. The steamer was going, these said men, to Ostend, it was about two o'clock when my brother, having paid their fares at the gangway, found himself safely on board the steamboat with his charges. There was food aboard, albeit at exorbitant prices, and the three of them contrived to eat a meal on one of the seats forward. There were already a couple of score of passengers abroad, some of whom had expended their last monies in securing a passage, but the captain lay off the black water until five in the afternoon, picking up passengers until the seated decks were even dangerously crowded. He would probably have remained longer had it not been for the sound of guns that began about that hour in the south. As if in an answer, the ironclad seaward fired a small gun and hoisted a string of flags. A jet of smoke sprang out of her funnels. Some of the passengers were of opinion that this firing came from shoeburiness, till it was noticed that it was growing louder. At the same time, Far away in the southeast, the masts and upper works of the three ironclads rose one after the other out of the sea, beneath clouds of black smoke. But my brother's attention speedily reverted to the distant firing in the south. He fancied he saw a comet of smoke rising out of the distant gray haze. 
The little steamer was already flapping her way eastward of the big crescent of shipping, and the low Essex coast was growing blue and hazy when a Martian appeared, small and faint in the remote distance. Advancing along the muddy coast from the direction of foulness, at that the captain on the bridge swore at the top of his lungs, the with fear and anger at his own delay, and paddles seemed infected with his terror, every soul aboard stood at the bulwark, or on the seats of the steamer, and stared at that distant shape, higher than the trees or church towers inland and advancing with a leisurely parody of a human stride. It was the first Martian my brother had seen, and he stood, more amazed and terrified, watching this titan advancing deliberately towards the shipping, wading further and further into the water as the coast fell away, then far away beyond the crouch, came another striding over some stunted trees, and then yet another, still far off, wading deep through a shiny mud flat that seemed to hang halfway up between sea and sky. They were all stalking seaward as if to intercept the escape of the multitudinous vessels that were crowded between foulness and nays. Despite of the throbbing exertions, of the engine of a little paddle boat and the pouring foam that her wheels flung behind her, she receded with terrifying slowness from this ominous advance. <sighs> Glancing northwestward, my brother saw the large crescent of shipping already writhing with the approaching terror. One ship passing behind another another coming round from broadside to end on. Steamships whistling and giving off volumes of steam, sails being let out, launches rushing hither and thither. He was so fascinated by this and by the creeping danger away to the left that he had no eyes for anything seaward. And then a swift movement of the steamboat she had suddenly come round to avoid being run down, flung him headlong from the seat upon which he was standing. There was a shouting all about him, a trampling of feet, and a cheer that seemed to be answered faintly. The steamboat lurched and rolled him over upon his hands. He sprang to his feet, saw to starboard, and not a hundred yards from their healing, pitching boat, a vast iron bulk, like the blade of a plow, tearing through the water, tossing it on either side in huge waves of foam that leaped towards the steamer, flinging her paddles helplessly in the air, and then sucking her deck down almost to the waterline. A douche of spray blinded my brother for a moment. When his eyes were clear again, he saw the monster had passed and was rushing landward. Big iron upperworks rose out of the headlong structure. From that twin funnel projected a spat of smoke, smoking blast shot with fire. It was the torpedo ram, Thunderchild, steaming headlong, coming to the rescue of that threatened shipping. Keeping his footing on the heavy deck by clutching the bulwark, my brother looked past this charging Levithion at the Martians again, and he saw the three of them now close together and standing so far out to see that their tripod supports were almost entirely submerged, thus sunken, and to see in remote perspective they appear far less formidable than the huge iron 
bulk to whose wake the steamer was pitching so helplessly. It would seem that they were regarding this new antagonist with astonishment. To their intelligence, it may be, the giant was even such another as themselves. The thunder child fired no gun, but simply drove full speed towards them. It was possible her not firing that enabled her to get so near the enemy as she did. They did not know what to make of her. One shell, and they would have sent her to the bottom for with the heat ray. She was steaming at a, such a pace that in a minute she seemed halfway between the steamboat and the Martians. A diminishing black bulk against the receding horizontal expanse of the Essex coast. Suddenly, the foremost Martian lowered his tube and discharged a canister of the black gas at the ironclad. It hit her larboard side and glanced off in an inky jet that rolled away to seaward an unfolding torrent of black smoke from which the ironclad drove clear to the watchers from the steamer low in the water and with the sun in their eyes it seemed as though she were already among the martians they saw the gaunt figures separating rising out of the water and as they retreated shoreward and one of them raised the camera like generator of the heat ray he held it, pointing obliquely downward, and a bank of steam sprang from the water at its touch. It must have driven through the iron of the ship's side like a white-hot iron rod through paper. A flicker of flame went up through the rising steam, and the Martian reeled and staggered. In another moment he was cut down and a great body of water and steam shot high in the air. The guns of the Thunder Child sounded through the reek, going off one after the other, and one shot splashed the water high close by the steamer, ricocheted towards the other flying ship to the north and smashed a smack to matchwood. But no one heeded that very much. At the sight of the Martians' collapse, the captain on the bridge yelled inarticulately, and all the crowding passengers on the steamer's stern shouted together, and then they yelled again. For surging not, beyond the white tumult drove something long and black, the flames streaming from its middle parts, its ventilators and funnels spouting fire. She was alive still. The steering gear, it seemed, was intact, and her engines working. She headed straight for a second Martian, and was within a hundred yards of him when the heat ray came to bear. Then, with a violent thud, a blinding flash, her decks, her funnels leaped upward. The Martian staggered with the violence of her explosion, and in another moment the flaming wreckage still driving forward with the impetus of its pace, had struck him, crumpled him up like a thing of cardboard. My brother shouted involuntarily, a boiling tumult of steam hid everything again. Two! yelled the captain. Everyone was shouting. The whole steamer from end to end rang with frantic cheering. That was taken up first by one, and then by all in the crowding multitude of ships and boats that was driving out to sea. The steam hung upon the water for many minutes, hiding the third Martian and the coast all together. And all this time the boat was paddling steadily out to sea and away from the fight. And when at last the confusion cleared, the drifting bank of black vapor intervened, and nothing of the Thunder Child could be made out, nor could the third Martian be seen. 
but the ironclads to seaward were now quite close and standing in towards shore past the sea boat. The little vessel continued to beat its way seaward, and the ironclads receded slowly towards the coast, which was hidden still by a marbled bank of vapor, part steam, part black gas, eddying and combining in the strangest way. The fleet of refugees was scattering to the northeast. Several smacks were sailing between the ironclads and the steamboat. After a time, before they reached the sinking cloud bank, the warships turned northward and then abruptly went about and passed into the thickening haze of evening southward. The coast grew faint and at last indistinguishable amid the low banks of clouds that were gathering about the sinking sun. Then suddenly, out of the golden haze of the sunset came the vibration of guns and a form of black shadows moving. Everyone Everyone struggled to the rail of the streamer and peered into the blinding furnace of the west. But nothing was to be distinguished clearly. A mass of smoke was slanting and barred the face of the sun. The steamboat throbbed on its way through an interminable suspense. The sun sank into the gray clouds. The sky flushed and darkened. The evening star trembled into sight. It was deep twilight when the captain cried out and pointed. My brother strained his eyes. Something rushed up into the sky. Out of the grayness rushed slantingly upward and very swiftly into the luminous clearness above the clouds in the western sky, something flat and broad and very large that swept round in a vast curve, grew smaller, sank slowly, and vanished again into the gray mystery of the night. And as it flew, it rained down darkness upon the land. Book Two The Earth Under the Martians Chapter One Underfoot In the first book, I have wandered so much from my own adventures to tell of the experiences of my brother that all through the last two chapters, I and the curate have been lurking in the empty house at Halliford, whither we fled to escape the black smoke. There I will resume. We stopped there, all day, Sunday night, and all the next day, the day of the panic, in a little island of daylight, cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. We could do nothing but wait, an aching inactivity during those two weary days. My mother was occupied by anxiety for my wife. I figured her at Leatherhead terrified in danger mourning me already as a dead man. I paced the room and tried aloud when I thought of how I was cut off from her, of all that might happen to her in my absence my cousin and i knew was brave enough for any emergency but he was not the sort of man to realize danger quickly to rise promptly what was needed now was not bravery but circumspection my only consolation was to believe that the martians were moving londonward and away from her such vague Anxieties keep the mind sensitive and painful. I grew very weary and irritable with the curate's perpetual ejaculations. I tried of the sight of his selfish despair. After some ineffectual remonstrance, I kept away from him, 
staying in a room, evidently a children's room, containing globes, forms, and copy books. When he followed me there, there, I went into a box room at the top of the house, and in order to be alone with my aching miseries, locked myself in. We were hopelessly hemmed in by the black smoke all that day and the morning of the next. There were signs of people in the next house on Sunday evening. A face at a window and a moving lights. And later the slamming of a door. But I do not know who these people were nor what became of them. We saw nothing of them next day. The black smoke drifted slowly riverward all through Monday morning, creeping nearer and nearer to us, driving at last along the roadway, outside the house that hit us, A Martian came across the fields about midday, laying the stuff with a jet of superheated steam that hissed against the walls, smashed all the windows it touched, and scalded the curate's hand as he fled out of the front room. When at last, we crept across the sodden floors and looked out again. The country northward was as though a black snowstorm had passed over it. Looking towards the river, we were astonished to see an uncountable redness mingling with the black of the scorched meadows. For a time, we did not see how this change affected our position, saying that we were relieved of our fear of the black smoke. But later, I perceived that we were no longer hemmed in, that now we might get away. So soon as I realized that the way of escape was open, my dream of action returned. But the curate was lethargic and unreasonable. We are safe here, he repeated, safe here. I resolved to leave him with that I had, wiser now for the artillery man's teaching. I sought out food and drink. I had found oil and rags for my burns. And I also took a hat and a flannel shirt that I found in one of the bedrooms. When it was clear to him that I meant to go alone, had reconciled myself to going alone, he suddenly roused himself to come. And all being quiet throughout the afternoon, we started about five o'clock, as I should judge along the blackened road to Sunbury. In Sunbury, at intervals along the road, were dead bodies lying in contorted attitudes, horses as well as men, overturned carts and luggage, all covered thickly with black dust. That pall of cindery powder made me think of what I had read of the destruction of Pompeii. We got to Hampton Court without misadventure. Our minds full of strange and unfamiliar appearances, and at Hampton Court our eyes were relieved to find a patch of green that escaped the suffocating drift. Oh, we went through Bushy Park with its deer going to and fro under the chestnuts. 
and some men and women hurrying in the distance towards Hampton. And so we came to Twickenham. These were the first people we saw. Oh, hey, across the road from the woods, beyond Ham and Petersham, were still a fire. Twickenham was uninjured by either heat ray or black smoke. And there were more people about here, though none of them could give us news. For the most part, they were like ourselves, taking advantage of low to shift their quarters. I have an impression that many of the houses here were still occupied by scared inhabitants. Too frightened even for flight. Here too, the evidence of a hasty route was abandoned along the road. I remember most vividly three smashed bicycles in a heap pounded into the road by the wheels of subsequent carts. We crossed Richmond Bridge about half past eight. We hurried across the exposed bridge, of course, but I noticed floating down the stream a number of red masses some many feet across. I did not know what these were. There was no time for scrutiny. And I put a more horrible interpretation of them than they deserved. Here again on the Surrey side were black dust that had once been smoke and dead bodies. A heap near the approach to the station, but we had no glimpse of the Martians until we were some way towards Barnes. We saw in the black and distance of a group of three people running down a side street towards the river. Otherwise, it seemed deserted. Up the hill, Richmond Town was burning briskly. Outside the town of Richmond, there was no trace of black smoke. And suddenly, as we approached Q, came a number of people running, and the upper works of a Martian fighting machine loomed and sighed over the trees not a hundred yards away from us. We stood aghast at our danger, and had the Martians looked down, we must immediately have perished. We were so terrified that we dared not go on, but turned aside and hid in a shed in a garden. There the curate crouched, weeping silently and refusing to stir again. But my fixed idea of reaching Leatherhead would not let me rest. And in the twilight, I ventured out again. I went through a shrubbery and along a passage beside a big house standing in its own grounds. And so emerged upon the road towards Kew. The curate I left in the shed, but he came hurrying after me. That second start was the most foolhardy thing I ever did, for it was manifest that the Martians were about us. No sooner had the curate overtaken me than we saw either the fighting machine we had seen before or another far away across the meadows in the direction of Q Lodge. Four or five little black figures hurried before it across the green grain of the field, and in a moment it was evident this Martian pursued them in three strides. He was among them, 
and they ran radiating from his feet in all directions. He used no heat ray to destroy them, but picked them up one by one. Apparently, he tossed them in the great metallic carrier which projected him behind him, much as a workman's basket hangs over his shoulders. It was the first time I realized that the Martians might have any other purpose than destruction with defeated humanity. We stood for a moment petrified, then turned and fled through a gate behind us into a walled garden, fell into rather than found a fortunate ditch, and lay there, scarce daring to whisper to each other until the stars were out. I suppose it was nearly eleven o'clock before we gathered courage to start again, no longer venturing into the road but sneaking along the hedgerows and through plantations and watching keenly through the darkness he on the right and I on the left. For the Martians, who seemed to be all about us in one place, we blundered upon a scorched, blackened area, now cool and ashen, and a number of scattered dead bodies of men burned horribly about the heads and trunks, but with their legs and boots mostly intact, and of dead horses fifty feet, perhaps, behind a line of four ripped guns and smashed gun carriages. Sheen it seemed, had escaped destruction, but the place was silent and deserted. Here we happened on no dead. Through the night it was too dark for us to see into the side roads of the place. And Sheen, my companion, suddenly complained of faintness and thirst, and we decided to try one of the houses. The first house we entered after a little difficulty with the window was a small, semi-detached villa, and I found nothing at eatable left in the place but some moldy cheese. There was, however, water to drink, and I took a hatchet, which promised to be useful in our next housebreaking. We then crossed to a place where the road turns towards Mort Lake. Here there stood a white house within a walled garden, and in the pantry of the domicile we found a store of food, two loaves of bread in a pan, an uncooked steak, the half of a ham. I give this catalogue so precisely, because as it happens we were destined to subsist upon this store for the next fortnight. Bottled beer stood under a shelf, and there were two bags of haricots, beans, and some limp lettuces. This pantry opened into a kind of wash-up kitchen, and in this was firewood. It was also a cupboard, in which we found nearly a dozen of burgundy, tin soups, and salmon, two bins of biscuits. We sat in the adjacent kitchen in the dark, for we dared not strike a light, and ate bread and ham, and drank beer out of the same bottle. The curate, who was still timorous and restless, was now, oddly enough, for pushing on, and I was urging him to keep up his strength by eating when the thing happened that was to imprison us. It can't be midnight yet, I said, and then came a blinding glare of vivid green light. Everything in the kitchen leapt up, clearly visible in green and black, and vanished again and then followed such a concussion as I have never heard before or since. So close as on the heels of this as to seem instantaneous came a thud behind me, a clash of glass, a crash and rattle of fallen masonry all around us. And the plaster of the ceiling came down upon us, smashing into a multitude of fragments upon our heads. I was knocked headlong across the floor against the oven handle and stunned. I was insensible for a long time, the curate told me, and when I came to, we were in darkness again, and he, with a wet face, as I found afterward, with blood from a cut forehead, was dabbing water over me. For some time I could not recollect what had happened. The things came to me slowly. A bruise on my temple asserted itself. 
Are you better? Asked the curate in a whisper. At last I answered him. I sat up. Don't move, he said. The floor is covered with smashed crockery from the dresser. You can't possibly move without making a noise, and I fancy they are outside. We both sat quite silent, so that we could scarcely hear each other breathing. Everything seemed deadly still, but once something near us, some plaster or broken brickwork slid down with a rumbling sound. Outside and very near was an intermittent metallic rattle. That, said the curate, when presently it had happened again. Yes, but what is it, said I. A Martian, said the curate. I listened again. It was not like the heat ray, I said, and for a time I was inclined to think one of the great flighting machines had stumbled against the house as I had seen one stumble against the tower of Shepherd and Church. Our situation was so strange and incomprehensible that for three or four hours until the dawn came, we scarcely moved. And then the light filtered in, not through the window, which remained black, but through a triangular aperture between a beam and a heap of broken bricks in the wall behind us. The interior of the kitchen we now saw grayly for the first time. The windows had been burst in by a mass of garden mold, which flowed over the table upon which we had been sitting and lay about our feet. Outside the soil was banked high against the house. At the top of the window frame we could see an uprooted drain pipe. The floor was littered with smashed hardware. The end of the kitchen towards the house was broken into, and since the daylight shone in there, it was evident the greater part of the house had collapsed. Contrasting vividly with this ruin was the neat dresser, stained in the fashion, pale green, and with a number of copper and tin vessels below it, the wallpaper imitating blue and white tiles, and a couple of colored supplements fluttering from the walls above the kitchen range. As the dawn drew, grew clearer, we saw through the gap in the wall the body of a Martian, standing sentinel, I suppose, over the still glowing cylinder. At the sight of that, we crawled as circumspectly as possible out of the twilight of the kitchen into the darkness of the scullery. Abruptly, the right interpretation dawned upon my mind. The fifth cylinder, I whispered. The fifth shot from Mars has struck the house and buried us under its ruins. For a time the curate was silent, and then he whispered, God have mercy upon us. I heard him presently whispering to himself, Save for the sound, we lay quiet still in the scullery. I, for my part, dared breathe and sat with my eyes fixed on the faint light of the kitchen door. I could just see the curate's face, the dim oval shape, and his collar and cuffs. Outside, there began a metallic hammering and a violent hooting. And then again, after a quiet interval, a hissing, like the hissing of an engine. These noises, for the most part, problematic, continued intermittently, and seemed, if anything, to increase in number as time wore on. Presently, a measured dudding and a vibration, though that made everything about us quiver, and the vessels in the pantry ring and shift began and continued. Once the light was eclipsed and the ghostly kitchen doorway became absolutely dark, for many hours we must have crouched there silent and shivering until our tired attention failed. At last I find myself awake and very hungry. I am inclined to believe we must have spent the greater portion of a day before that awakening. 
My hunger was at a stride so insistent that it moved me to action. I told the curate I was going to seek food and felt my way forward towards the pantry. He answered, he made no answer, but so soon as I began eating, the faint noise I made stirred him up, and I heard him crawling after me. Chapter 2 What We Saw from the Ruined House After eating, we crept back to the scullery. And there I must have dozed again, for when presently I looked round, I was alone. The thudding vibration continued. With wearisome persistence, I whispered for the curate several times, and at last felt my way to the door of the kitchen. It was still daylight, and I perceived him across the room, lying against the triangular hole that looked upon the Martian. His soldier shoulders were hunched so that his head was hidden from me. I could hear a number of noises, almost like those in an engine shed, and the place rocked with a beating thud. Through the aperture in the wall I could see the top of a tree touched with gold and with warm blue of a tranquil evening sky. For a moment or so, I remained watching the curate, and then I advanced, crouching and stepping with extreme care amid the broken crockery that littered the floor. I touched the curate's leg, and he started so violently that a mass of plaster went sliding down outside and fell with a loud impact. I gripped his arm, fearing he might cry out, and for a long time we crouched motionless. Then I turned to see how much of our rampart remained. The detachment of the plaster had left a vertical slit open in the debris, and by raising myself cautiously across a beam, I was able to see out of the gap into what had been overnight a quiet suburban roadway. Vast, indeed, was the change that we beheld. The fifth cylinder must have fallen right into the midst of the house we had first visited. The building had vanished, completely smashed, pulverized, and dispersed by the blow. The cylinder lay now far beneath the original foundation, deep in a hole already vastly larger than the pit I had looked into at Woking. The earth all around it had splashed under the tremendous impact. Splashed is the only word and lay in heaped piles that hid the masses of the adjacent houses. It had behaved exactly like mud under the violent blow of a hammer. Our house had collapsed backwards, and the front portion, even on the ground floor, had been destroyed completely. By a chance, the kitchen and scullery had escaped and stood buried now under soil and ruins closed in by tons of earth on every side save towards the cylinder. Over that aspect we hung now on the very edge of the great cylinder pit the Martians were engaged in making. The heavy beating sound was evidently just behind us, and ever and again a bright green vapor drove up like a veil across the, our people. The cylinder was already open in the center of the pit, and on the far edge of the pit, amid the smashed and gravel-heaped shrubbery, one of the great fighting machines deserted by its occupant, stood stiff and tall against the evening sky. At first I scarcely, scarcely noticed the pit and the cylinder, although it has been convenient to describe them first, on account of the extraordinary glittering mechanism I saw busy in the excavation, and on account of the strange creatures that were crawling slowly and painfully across the heaped mold near it. The mechanism, it certainly was, that held my attention first. It was one of those complicated fabrics that have since been called handling machines, and the study of which has already given such an enormous epitus to terrestrial invention. 
as it dawned upon me first, it presented a sort of metallic spider with five jointed, agile legs and with an extraordinary number of jointed levers, bars, and reaching and clutching tentacles about its body. Most of it, arms were retracted, but with three long tentacles, it was fishing out a number of rods, plates, and bars which lined the covering and apparently strengthened the walls of the cylinder. These, as it extracted from them, were lifted out and deposited upon a level surface of earth behind it. Its motion was so swift, complex, and perfect that at first I did not see it as a machine in spite of its metallic glitter. The fighting machines were coordinated and animated to an extraordinary pitch, but nothing to compare with this. People who have never seen these structures have only the ill-imagined efforts of artists or the imperfect descriptions of such witnesses as myself to go upon scarcely realize that living quality. I recall particularly the illusion of one of the first pamphlets to give a consecutive account of the war. The artist had evidently made a hasty study of one of the fighting machines, and there his knowledge ended. He presented them as tilted, stiff tripods without either flexibility or subtlety, and with an altogether misleading monotony of effect. The pamphlet containing these renderings had a considerable vogue, and I mention them here simply to warn the reader against the impression they may have created. They were no more like the Martians I saw in action than a Dutch doll is like a human being. To my mind, the pamphlet would have been much better without them. At first, I say, the handling machine did not impress me as a machine, but as a crab-like creature with a glittering integument. The controlling Martian, whose delicate tentacles actuated its movements, seeming to be simply the equivalent of the crab's cerebral portion. But then I perceived the resemblance of its gray, brown, shiny leather integument to that of the other sprawling bodies beyond, and the true nature of this dexterous workman dawned upon me. With that realization, my interest shifted to those other creatures. The Martian, the real Martians. Already I had had a transient impression of these, and the first nausea no longer obscured my observations. Moreover, I was concealed and motionless, and under no urgency of action. There were, I now saw, the most unearthly creatures it is possible to conceive. They were huge round bodies, or rather heads, about four feet in diameter, each body having in front of it a face. The face had no nostrils. Indeed, the Martian do not seem to have any sense of smell, but it had a pair of very large, dark-colored eyes, and just beneath this, a kind of fleshy beak. In the back of this head or body, I scarcely know how to speak of it, was the single tight, tympanic surface, since known to be anatomically an ear, though it must have been almost useless in our dense air. In a group round the mouth were sixteen slender, almost whip-like tentacles arranged in two bunches of eight each. These bunches have since been named rather aptly by the distinguished anatomist, Professor Howes, the hands. Even as I saw these Martians for the first time, they seemed to be, to be endeavoring to raise themselves on these hands. But of course, with the increased weight of terrestrial conditions, this was impossible. There is a reason to suppose that on Mars they may have progressed upon them with some facility. 
the internal anatomy, I may remark here as dissection has since shown was almost equally simple. The greater part of the structure was the brain, sending enormous nerves to the eyes, ears, and tactile tentacles. Besides this were the bulky lungs into which the mouth opened, and the heart of its vessels. The pulmonary distress caused by the denser atmosphere and greater gravitational attraction was only too evident in the convulsive movements of the outer skin. And this was the sum of the Martian organs, strange as it may seem to a human being, all the complex apparatus of digestion which makes up the bulk of our body, did not exist in the Martians. They were heads, merely heads. In trails, they had none. They did not eat, much less digest. Instead, they took the flat, fresh, living blood of other creatures and ejected it into their own veins. I have myself seen this being done, as I shall mention in its place. But squeamish, as I may seem, I cannot bring myself to describe what I could not endure even to continue watching. Let it suffice to say blood obtained from a still living animal, in most cases from a human being, was drawn directly by means of a little pipette into the recipient canal. The bare idea of this is no doubt horribly repulsive to us, but at the same time I think that we should remember how repulsive our carnivorous habits would seem to an intelligent rabbit. The psychological advantages of the practice of injection are undeniable, if one thinks of the tremendous waste of time and energy occasioned by eating in the digestive process. Our bodies are half made up of the glands and tubes and organs occupied in turning heterogeneous food into blood. The digestive processes and their reaction upon the nervous system sap our strength and color our mind. Men go happy or miserable as they have healthy or unhealthy livers or sound gastric glands. But the Martians were lifted above all those organic fluctuations of mood and emotion. Their undeniable preference for men as their source of nourishment is partly explained by the nature of the remains of the victims they had brought with them as provisions from Mars. These creatures, no judge from the shriveled remains that have fallen into human hands, were bipeds with flimsy, silicious skeletons, almost like those of the silicious sponges, and feeble musculature, standing about six feet high, and having round, erect heads, and large eyes and flinty sockets. Two or three of these seemed to have brought in each cylinder, and all were killed before Earth was reached. It was just as well for them for the mere attempt to stand upright upon our planet would have broken every bone in their bodies. And while I am engaged in this description, I may add in this place certain further details which, although they were not all evident to us at the time, will enable the reader, who is unacquainted with them, to form a clearer picture of these offensive creatures. And three other points, their physiological physiology differed strangely from ours. Their organisms did not sleep any more than the heart of man sleeps, since they had no extensive muscular mechanism to recuperate. That periodical extinction was unknown to them. They had little or no sense of fatigue, it would seem. On earth they could never have moved without effort, yet even to the last they kept in action. In 24 hours they did 24 hours worth of work, as even on earth is perhaps the case with the ants. And in the next day, wonderful as it seems in a sexual world, the Martians were absolutely without sex. 
and therefore without any of the tumultuous emotions that arise from the difference between among men. A young Martian, there can now be no dispute, was really born upon earth during the war, and it was found attached to its parent partially butted off, just as a young lily bulb spud off, or the young animals in the freshwater polyp, and man, and in all the higher terrestrial animals, such a method of increase has disappeared. But even on this earth, it was certainly the primitive method. Among the lower animals, up even to those first cousins of the vertebrated animals, the tunicates, the two processes occurred side by side. But finally, the sexual method superseded its competitor altogether. On Mars, however, just the reverse had apparently been the case. It is worthy of remark that a certain speculative writer of quasi-scientific repute, writing long before the Martian invasion, did forecast for man a structure not unlike the actual Martian condition. His prophecy, I remember, appeared in November or December 1893 in a long defunct publication, The Paul Mall Budget, and I recall a caricature of it in a pre-Martian periodical called Punch. He pointed out, writing in a foolish, facetious tone, that the perfection of mechanical appliances must ultimately supersede limbs. The perfection of chemical devices, digestion, that such organs as hair, external nose, teeth, ears, chin, were no longer essential parts of the human being, and that the tendency of natural selection would lie in the direction of their steady diminution through the coming ages. The brain alone remained a cardinal necessity. Only one other part of the body had a strong case for survival, and that was the hand, teacher and agent of the brain. While the rest of the body dwindled, the hands would grow larger. There is many a true word written in jest. And here, in the Martians, we have beyond dispute the actual accomplishment of such a suppression of the animal side of the organism by the intelligence. To me, it is quite credible that the Martians may be descended from beings not unlike ourselves, but a gradual development of brain and hands, the latter giving rise to the two bunches of delicate tentacles at last, at the expense of the rest of the body. Without the body, the brain would, of course, become a mere selfish intelligence, without any of the emotional substratum of the human being. The last salient point in which the systems of these creatures differed from ours was in what one might have thought a very trivial particular, microorganisms, which cause so much disease and pain on Earth, have either never appeared upon Mars or Martian sanitary science eliminated them years ago, ages ago. A hundred diseases, all of fevers and contagions of human life, consumption, cancers, tumors, and such morbidities, never entered the scheme of their life. And speaking of the differences between the life of Mars and terrestrial life, I may allude here to the curious suggestion of the red weed, Apparently, the vegetable kingdom and Mars, instead of having green for a dominant color, is of a vivid blood-red tint. At any rate, the seed which the Martians intentionally or accidentally brought with them gave rise, in all cases, to red-colored growths. Only that known popularly as the red weed, however, gained any footing in competition with the terrestrial forms. The red creeper was quite a transitory growth, and few people have seen it growing. For a time, however, the red weed grew with astonishing vigor and luxuriance. It spread up the sides of the pit by the third and fourth day of our imprisonment, and its cactus-like branches found 
formed a carmine fringe to the edge of our triangular window. And afterwards, I found it broadcast throughout the country, and especially wherever there was a stream of water. The Martians had what appears to be have been an auditory organ, a single round drum at the back of their head body, and eyes with a visual range not very different from ours except that, according to Phillips, blue and violet were as black to them. It is commonly supported that they communicated by sound and tentacular gesticulations. This is asserted, for instance, in the able but hastily compiled pamphlet, written evidently by someone not an eyewitness of Martian actions, to which I have already alluded, and which, so far, has been the chief source of information concerning them. Now, no surviving human being saw so much of the Martian in action as I did. I take no credit to myself for an accident, but the fact is so. And I assert that I watched them closely time and time, and that I have seen four, five, and at once six of them sluggishly perform the most elaborate complicated operations together without either sound or gesture. Their peculiar hooting invariably preceded feeding and had no modulation and was, I believe, in no sense a signal, but merely the expiration of air preparatorily to the suction operation. I have a certain claim to at least an elementary knowledge of psychology, and in this matter I am convinced, as firmly as I am convinced of anything, that the Martians interchanged thoughts without any physical intermediation. And I have been convinced of this in spite of strong preconceptions before the Martian invasion as an occasional reader here or there may remember I had written with some little or there I have written with some little venomance against the telepathic theory. The Martians wore no clothes. Their conceptions of ornament and decorum were necessarily different from ours, and not only were they evidently much less sensible of changes of temperature than we are, but changes of pressure do not seem to have affected their health at all seriously. Yet though they were no clothing, it was in their other artificial additions to their bodily resources that their great superiority over man lay. We men, with our bicycles and road skates, our Lillian, though soaring machines, our guns and sticks and so forth, are just in the beginning of the evolution that the Martians have worked out. They have become pr practically mere brains, wearing different bodies according to their needs, just as men wear suits of clothes and take a bicycle in a hurry or an umbrella in the wet. And of their applications, perhaps nothing is more wonderful to a man than the curious fact than what is the dominant feature of almost all human devices in mechanism is absent. The wheel is absent. Among all the things they brought to earth, there is no trace or suggestion of their use of wheels. One would have at least expected in locomotion, and in the connection it is curious to remark that even on this earth, Nature has never hit upon the wheel, or has preferred a other expedient to its development. Not only did the Martians either not know of, which is incredible, or is sustained from the wheel, but in their apparatus singularly, little use is made of the fixed pivot or relatively fixed pivot, with circular motions thereabout, confined to one plate. Almost all the joints of the machinery present at a complicated system of sliding parts moving over 